Thank you for the gracious words, Bishop Baker. I have a little outline. I will start with a, a fresh delight. Then I will go into the theme of reconciliation. Reconciliation. I'm not speaking directly of reconciliation. I'm talking about reconfi. F, not C. But I'll talk about reconciliation too. I'll try to give you a basic understanding of reconciliation. Then I'll discuss reconciliation as a corrective, redemptive dynamic. I'll make a distinction between reconciliation and reconciliation. Then I'll talk about reconciliation in the Igbo African context where I, I am applying uh, this dynamic to my own people. Then I'll discuss distortions in American humanity, perceptions and prejudices. And I had um, last week or two weeks watching the CNN, heard about Nelly Harper Lee. And while I was in Ghana last week, I had to pick up the book To Kill a Mockingbird in order to get an understanding of what was going on about racism through that book. I only succeeded in getting the dramatized version of To Kill a Mockingbird, but I, did, I do mention it in my discussion. Then I'll talk about humanity, the need for unification and rectification. Then I'll talk about recti-valuing one another, recti-valuing one another, American blacks, American whites. Then I'll make a call for personal and corporate penitence. And then speak directly on conciliating Americans, conciliating Americans or new creating America. And consequently, equi promoting justice, equi defending one another. And then I'll mention something about a humbling ritual of conciliation or reconciliation. So let me start with a fresh delight. In the summer of the year 2003, I had the joy of speaking to a broad American audience in Charleston, South Carolina, thanks to the kind invitation of the Most Reverend Robert Baker, Bishop of the Diocese of Charleston at that time, and currently the Bishop of Birmingham, Alabama. My providential meeting with Bishop Baker in the year 2000 for the extraordinary jubilee celebration of Jesus' birth in St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican City, opened the way for that invitation. Behind Bishop Baker's invitation lay his pastoral concern to reach out to African Americans. He wanted to know the African Americans better and to provide uh, for the services to them. That was why. We now got into discussion and he invited me to send him a priest from my diocese who is still working in Charleston in response to that request to reach out to African Americans. And I want to acknowledge um, Kathleen Merritt who facilitated my visit that year. Well, Bishop Baker is aware that I'm fairly acquainted with American history, with its struggles, and that is why he thinks that my presence through a public talk might assist in his mission and the mission of the church in this part of the world. Having already been acquainted with the European world through the Irish Catholic missionaries and British colonizers, and through my studies and sojourn in Europe, I welcomed this opportunity to come once again to talk because many of my folks were enslaved, especially in the South Carolina, Georgia area, in Virginia. Uh, two years ago, I was in Stanton, Virginia as a guest speaker at the inauguration of the Igbo Village Farm. Uh, the state of Virginia decided to honor the slaves, the Africans who were brought there. So a village has been newly built up, reflecting the type of village I come from. 
Now, the rebonding that I experienced with African-American students in, at the Catholic University in 1980 during the Black History Week helped to stay, set in motion the kind of thoughts that are going on in me and that led to my first talk on reconciliation. Uh, that paper was entitled Roots, Branches, Graftings and Fruits, the Reconciliatory Challenge to African Americans and Humanity at Large. I realized that Alex Halley, who had written the book Roots, came to Gambia, Jufure, Gambia, to find his roots. Then I came to America and I found my branches. So the African Americans here are my branches, whereas I am their roots. And so I came. Now the process of grafting and regrafting is taking place. So since then, I've continued to explore the theme reconciliation. And for this particular paper or talk, I am captioning the presentation Confiliating Americans, Rectivaluing One Another, A Theology and Practice of Reconciliation. With the unraveling of racial relationships in America, which also affects all of us in our intimate global world, I wish I could contribute in some little way to America's strenuous efforts to heal and bridge its racial divide. Reconciliation, a basic understanding. What do you understand by reconciliation? It sounds strange. The root words from which reconciliation is derived are filius and filia, the Latin for son and daughter. These words fuse into one as in filial, expressing a relationship to father or mother. Filiation, affiliation are generally in use to describe belonging as a child, a son or a daughter to a parent or to an organization. You have affiliate companies, a bonding. In my wider reflection on affiliation in the context of the human family, as, in, as well as in church religious context, words like refiliation, confiliation, co-filiation, defiliation, rectifiliation, and reconciliation have surfaced. Refiliation would mean restoration to the status of son or daughter. Confiliation would mean a mutual share in the state of son or daughter from a common kinship or stock. Confiliation would also imply a reciprocal recognition of equal sonship, equal daughtership. Defiliation would mean a refusal or a denial of sonship or daughtership to someone or to nullify his, his or her status. Reconciliation would imply a return to right and deserved relationship as son or daughter. Reconciliation would also mean the reconstitution, the reestablishment of the status of son or daughter to any person whatsoever. It would also mean the conjoining our, or the, the new kinning, new kinning of humans into fellow sons and daughters in equal dignity. Any of these terms would be useful depending on the context of use. Reconciliation tends to be universally inclusive. Reconciliation, a corrective redemptive dynamic. So given the distortions in perceiving and reacting and relating to human persons across our extensive human family. Reconciliation serves and is intended to serve as a principle or dynamic reaffirming the primacy of sonship and daughtership for every human ahead of the still important category of brother and sister. I bless primacy on my being son, on your being daughter, over 
being brother or sister. When Albert Schweitzer, the great German doctor musician, uh, the Swiss doctor, was in Lamborghini, Africa, working, he was asked what he thought of Africans. Somebody said, are Africans your brothers? He said, yes, they are my brother, but they are junior brothers, junior brothers. They are not on the same level as himself. The sociological or religious extension of brotherhood or sisterhood, fraternity or sorority, are secondary to the primacy of filiality, confiliality, or cofiliality. Thus, reconciliation serves as a rectifying or corrective force in assuring that the dignity of every son or daughter in the human family is upheld and defended. Given historic and heroic efforts by various individuals in confronting persons, groups, ideas, practices, customs, institutions, and systems that distort and assault the dignity of humans in so many places on earth, reconciliation comes across as a redeeming and healing dynamic that served in the past and continues to serve in the present in the cause of humanity's liberation, redignification, and new kinment. I hold in great respect and esteem persons like St. Paul, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela, who expanded in varying degrees the thrust of humanity's reconciliation. Of course, before Paul became the apostle of the Gentiles of the nations, he was a die-hard discriminator against Gentiles. But conversion in Christ caused a revolution in his thinking and affection. As much as I admire these other heroes, the reconciliation of humans in Jesus Christ in the most compassionate and universal way and into which I have been providentially and thankfully drawn has been the principal motivating force activating my engagement with reconciliation as a practical human working instrument and a persuasive theological grace. I know I've quarreled with Jesus Christ. I confronted him as a colonizer, as an ambiguous missionary within my context, within my culture. In a certain reading of him, I saw him as being behind the entire colonial enslavement project of Europe. I thought of him first as a European, as an Englishman or Irishman, but eventually I have submitted to him, not just as a European, but as the Son of God, crucified slave of humanity. For from being son of God to becoming the crucified slave of humanity, Jesus experienced humanity's utter wickedness. But by forgiving all this wickedness, and rising from the dead, Jesus exposed the misery and futility of all human wickedness. Jesus has proved through his resurrection that he is filius perfectus, who rectifiates us to God our Father and rectifiates us to one another. He is the filius rectus and filius perfectus. 
This word Phileus comes from the filament, filing, being in the correct line. It's like a thread. Jesus is the perfect thread, the perfect link between us and God. That is why he rectifiates us. He rectifiates us to God and rectifiates us to one another. He is our rectifiator and our reconciliator. So that is the main theological background to the rest of the discussion. Reconciliation and recon, reconciliation and reconciliation, overlap and difference. In my first internet check in 2003, the internet mistook the word reconciliation for reconciliation. Each time you try to punch for reconciliation, reconciliation will jump up. In my recent search, it has begun to present both terms separately without a clear distinction. Reconciliation is or ought to be a stable disposition, a secure situation in which humans relate to one another as dignifiedly and respectfully as co-sons and co-daughters, co-filiates. We are co-filiates. Naturally, across the board, irrespective of our fates, we are all co-filiates, sharers in the identity of sonship or daughtership. In Christ, we are confiliates because we are sharing sacramentally by conversion into his sonship. To reach this stable state or note of peace, accusations, dialogue, repentance, and forgiveness leading to reconciliation need to be welcomed. Reconciliation presupposes hurts, ill feelings, and conflicts. On the other hand, Reconciliation stresses the dignity of every human, of every son, of every daughter, irrespective of hurts and ill feelings. Your hurts and my ill feelings cannot and should not damage or take anything away from my dignity as a human being, as a son or daughter of God. Reconciliation abhors violence to the sacredness and preciousness of the, of the human person. For this reason, reconciliation adds an absolute objective dimension to the peacemaking and harmonizing trust of reconciliation by upholding the sacred integrity of the person and insisting on respect for the equal dignity of every human by, by nature or by creation or by the historic redemption in Christ. Hate the sin. Don't hate the sinner because this, the sinner returns his integ or her integrity as a person. Now let me enter or take you a little away back to, into my own cultural environment, reconciliation in the Igbo African context how I am trying to end the human divide in my own culture. When I was 13 years of age, as I rode on my bicycle to a market, I saw written on the road with kukuyam chalk, usu Lao, let outcasts disappear. I started wondering what this was about. It was in the seminary that one day a friend of mine called me aside to inform me that a friend of mine with whom I often associate in the seminary belongs to the outcast system. And I said, what is that? And he said, if you stay with such a person, there are all kinds, all kinds of things that will be crawling around you. Eventually, 
I discovered that nothing crawled around any human being. Rather, it was part of the heritage that my people, the Igbos, had. By the 10th of May 1956, under the impact of Christianity and modern enlightenment, the Eastern Nigerian government legally abrogated the demarcation of Igbos into three groups. The freeborn, otherwise known as the Diala, these are the landlords, the owners of the land. The Osu, or the outcasts, the enslaved, ritually enslaved, dedicated to spirits. And then there's another group called the Ume, the prone to die. Intermarriages or intermarriage does not take place between these three categories of Igbos, all my own people. The so-called freeborn Igbo would not associate with the so-called outcast Igbos. And they would give no thought at all to marrying the so-called prone to die. The so-called slave-born were willing to marry the so-called freeborn, but were scared stiff by the so-called freeborn etc. Now, a close reading of Jesus' relationship with the Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles opened my eyes to Jesus' redemptive, filiative mission on this earth. With what Jesus did, breaking down the barriers between Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles, I began to confront this divide in my own culture. Instead of identifying with either of the three, I decided to reject identification with any of them. And I eventually found myself breaking up and breaking out of all conscious, reflexive, and subconscious attachment to each and all three groups. By a combination of grace and continued self-probing, I found a new and unbelievable freedom and courage, which I'm now offering to Igbos once enslaved by Igbo religious cultural divides. Meanwhile, I am now often called the outcast archbishop because I identify with each and every one doing marriages now against parental wishes. Within the last five years, I'm sure over 20 marriages have taken place. It's not just me doing this work. There are others who have found the courage to break the inhuman customs in my own culture. It is from this angle that I look into the American situation with the distortions in American perceptions and prejudices. Just as distortions existed in Palestine and in my own Igbo world and in other worlds leading to self-justifying claims of nobility, superiority, and chosenness, by some religious, ethnic, national, or class groups over their fellow humans, considered less noble, less gifted, less chosen. So in America, for over 400 years, there have been distortions in relating to fellow humans, leading to the kind of divide that makes this conversation on black-white relations necessary and relevant. Black, white, brown, yellow, blue, and green etc., are normal color references and distinctions which are found in every human community, but which are more used in describing and pointing to things than in describing or defining humans. Among my people, there are those who are called Mr. Woji, Mr. Black Person, Mr. Dark Person. You also find people called Mr. Onyocha, Mr. White Person, without that indicating any color distinction between persons. 
So among the Igbos who are largely black in external perception, black, dark, white, fair, feature in various names. But with the commercialization of Africans at large by Europeans and Arabs and the illegal enslavement in various states of America, being African, being black, being a slave, and being an inferior human became synonymous in the psyche of Europeans, Arabs, and white Americans who were apparently white. So I think it is this American original sin or European original sin of slavery that equiparated Africans who were largely black with being inferior human beings. Particularly among Europeans and white Americans, being European, being white, being a master owning slaves, and being superior became synonymous in their psyche. So we are dealing with a subconscious and for some pre-conscious attitude which have become transmitted and inherited. The inferiority of Africans or the so-called inferiority of Africans and the so-called superiority of European Americans became a propagated and programmed social agenda etched officially into segregational laws. Blanket white su supremacy over blacks put an enforced ceiling or barrier to blacks' rights and aspirations. Of course, the resistance of Africans to this inhuman and color definition and demarcation took many forms, including the mass suicide of my people, the Igbos in St. Simon's Island off the coast of Georgia. Up till today, they say if you go there, there's a, an eerie feeling where my people, instead of accepting to be slaves, decided to perish. It took the American War of Independence in which Africans fought side by side with white Americans to begin the process of tolerating Africans, blacks within the American nation. Eventually, it was the Emancipation Declaration and finally the Civil Rights Revolution that brought the resistance of blacks to slavery to a decisive point. I won't spend time on Nele Hapali and the American conscience since that was broached yesterday, but the issue was that the American conscience was prevented from implementing the truth that was discovered. You know the truth, and the truth is that some Negroes lie, and some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, black or white, and so also with some white men. Some white men lie. Some white men are not to be trusted around women, black or white. This is a truth that applies to the entire human race and to no particular race. Well, by 1960, the wind of transformation was blowing across Africa and Asia. And that was what forced even Harold Wilson in England to declare, we reject the idea of an inherent superiority of one race over another. Our policy, therefore, in South Africa, addressing South Africa, is non-racial. And the fact is that in this modern world, no country, not even the greatest, can live for itself alone. Nearly 2,000 years ago, when the whole of the civilized world was comprised within the confines of the Roman Empire, St. Paul proclaimed one of the great truths of history. We are all members of one another. And so we've come to a stage that the globalization, the communication that is going on has brought us to a point where there has to be a unification of humans in order to break the various divides across the world. The African-American black must be given back his or her rightful dignity. 
the European American white must equally be given his or her rightful humanity. But all this must not lead to the overvaluation of any human being. Rather, it requires the rectivaluation of one another. So let me talk about the rectivaluation of one another because we cannot become a family of sons and daughters without according each other appropriate respect. In a world that is becoming one global family, every person must be rightly valued as a sacred or dignified entity. My worth or value as a person or a human being does not depend on what anybody thinks of me. Your, your value or worth as a person or a human being does not depend on what I think of you. There's an objectivity that has to be appreciated. Rather, I am duty-bound to accord to every person the respect due to him or her as a sacred or precious entity. You are equally duty-bound to accord to me the respect due to me as a sacred or precious entity, no matter what else you may think of me. The history of the American nation shows a tragic devaluation and undervaluation of certain of its citizens. This devaluation, this undervaluation, has included the questioning of these persons as to whether they are human at all. This has been the tragedy uh, of the West that in the early church, citizens from all parts of the world, especially North Africa, made up the Christian world. But by 1838 in Scotland, it was being debated whether the African had a soul so that baptism might be accorded to the African. There are also places that continue to debate. Maybe there are, so, there are those who might still be debating whether Africans are humans. In some cases, they have been abused and treated as animals, as beasts of burden, without any right to resist whatever their master does to or with them. Africans in America or African Americans have been largely the direct victims of this alienation from the human family, this dehumanization. Up till today, certain white supremacists see African Americans in this way and would like to do so forever. For these persons and their supporters, the enslavement or maltreatment of African Americans was, is a command, a natural disposition of things in the human family. Some say from the doctrine of divine selection to the doctrine of natural selection by evolution, that the white man has so evolved that he is a superhuman and the African is still on the rungs of the ladder coming up. So these are theories that have been fabricated in the past. On the other hand, the American has shown a tragic overvaluation of certain of its citizens to the point of canonizing their superiority over African Americans in, in every conceivable way. Every legal recourse was fabricated in order to distinguish the humanity of Europeans in America European Americans, whites, from the animality of African Americans, blacks. America's White House, the home of America's presidents, was never intended to house blacks. That's why it's just called White House. Maybe, I'm not too sure. It's about time the name was changed to Peace House. The White House must become Peace House if America is to have peace. Since Obama and Michelle entered that house, the venom against African Americans has intensified in the white supremacists. It is this overvaluation or superiorization of whites that fuels the kind of tragic shooting of unarmed and praying African Americans in Charleston, South Carolina. While a lot of progress has been made in giving full citizen and voting rights to African Americans and others who were equally deprived of such, the task of valuing one another 
as rightfully and equally human among and between Americans, blacks and whites, is still at a preliminary stage. It is a matter of the psych. Whether you are black or white, it is a challenge for all of us. Personal and corporate penitence. Whites and blacks, are you ready? At this point of convergence and success in even coming together, because we have come a long way from the past, all humans, especially all Americans, have a duty, individually and corporately, to reject, renounce, and denounce those inhuman and unjust attitudes, habits, preferences, prejudices, insinuations, connivances, and structures which have nurtured and sustained the mutual fear, dread, and pain that continue to hurt Americans' relationship with one another. All have sinned and fallen short of the dignity of humans and the glory of God. As grave or light as your guilt may be, as grave or light as guilt may lie on this side or on the other side or on any side, nobody can remain indifferent or cynical to the imperative of denouncing the evils and dismantling the evil structures associated with black-white relationship in America. Every human is sacred, black and white. All lives, black and white, matter. When black and white lives truly matter and are not subjected to unjust differential treatment, there will be no need to continue the current clarion call, Black Lives Matter. It is because there has been differential in, injustice or differential justice that the kind of protest that you get arise. For centuries or millennia, the Jews discriminated among themselves, creating inhuman barriers. So too, the Igbo people, among, among whom I live and work, gradually and sometimes speedily, the chains of dehumanization and the walls of discrimination have collapsed. For the past 55 years, I have continued to question, confront, review, modify, correct, and change inhuman ideas, views, positions, prejudices, and beliefs that I and my ethnic or racial group previously held against one another or against others in another ethnic or racial group. In the process, I have been noticing a revolution in my perception of humans, appreciating their substantive worth or value beyond color marks and other visible features. Since self-pride or group pride, group egoism is at the root of dislike, hatred, enmity, and discrimination towards others, the grace of humility must be sought either directly from God or indirectly from the heroic, compassionate love of significant figures in our human family. The penitential conversation on black-white relations in America is a step in the right direction. Are you ready or open to the revolution in perception and human tenderness about which Pope Francis has spoken? Confiliating Americans, new creating America. As Americans, black, white, brown, yellow, blue, etc., certainly and truly repent of historic and current evils and violence visited upon one another. As Americans emphasize more and more the dignity and beauty of one another, the way to a new and healthier relationship am among Americans will be opened. For 2,000 years and more, the pathway to new and healthier relationships among humans and Americans has been upheld and equally ignored. The history of America, the history of greatness, as well as the history of disaster. By entering into our human family and bearing lovingly and patiently the kinds of evil that we inflict upon one another out of foolish pride 
and dread of one another, Jesus set in motion the filiation movement that continues to draw humans from across every human group and divide into one family of humanity in which everyone's sacredness is preserved. By, by intimately sharing in the divine sonship of Jesus Christ who humbled himself to share in our human sonship, Jesus' filiation movement now becomes a confiliation movement offering to every people and every person the grace to share in the unifying sonship of Jesus. See, you talk about a pluribus unum, but before a pluribus unum, there is the de unico, de filio unico. We come from a unique son that has made possible the multiplicity of sons and daughters. Convinced of this unifying kinship of all humans in the filiation sonship of Christ, the early apostles expanded the confiliation movement. Christianity is a confiliation movement, drawing sons and daughters of God from every language, every nation, into the one family of God, inaugurated in Christ, the Holy Family of Nazareth, the one holy Catholic Church, is a confiliation movement. This movement clearly declared that the hostility that kept Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles apart has now been ended in the very person of Jesus Christ through his life and death. To a large extent, the life and death or work of persons like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Mother Teresa of Calcutta have contributed to ending the hostility in our common world, but they absorbed this hostility in their own lives, sharing people's misery. Like other humans on this earth, Americans, black and white, are challenged to see, recognize, and welcome, and treat each other as confiliates, as sharers, in the one humanity, new created in Christ. Of course, it's not only Americans that this matter applies to. Confiliation is a universal movement. For in this one humanity, everyone should feel at home, gladly appreciating one another and readily coming to the help of one another, whether black, white, blue, or yellow. With such confiliation, such unifying sense of humanity, a new America will be in the offing. To make, to make America great again will mean upholding the inalienable rights of every American and the unifiliation, the unifiliation of Americans in the spirit of a pluribus unum. The consequences of erective valuing one another would therefore be there will be no separate legal framework for whites one for whites, one for blacks. This is part of the problem that discrimination, it may not be in the Constitution because the Constitution talks about equality of all men and women, but in legal practices, special pleadings, things have been different. In the spirit of the oneness of Americans as equally sacred and dignified fellow humans, Equity and fairness must be shown to everyone. Any element of partiality in any case in court must be justified on the basis of the redressing of an injustice. Whiteness or blackness per se is not and cannot be the basis of justice in human relations or in the law court. Therefore, all Americans must join hands as one humanity, as one family, to promote justice and peace in a way that can be objectively perceived as right and just. A positive appreciation of and regard for one another's sacred dignity must compel Americans to defend one another's right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Acts of negligence or malicious refusal in this regard would have to be revisited for redress and rectification. By equally promoting justice for all Americans and every American, and by equitably defending the fundamental and other rights of all Americans and every American, the new and great America 
will become a true beacon of humanity's quest for just and peaceful oneness. A lot of nations admire America. That is why America has this global challenge to become a beacon for justice and for equity. Finally, I invite you to a humbling ritual of conciliation. In order to bring home the grace and challenge of conciliation and reconciliation, I take my cue from Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet. And the disciples came from the Jews, from the Greeks, or from the Samaritans as a way of new bonding, new kinning humanity. So I take my cue from Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet, which was a prelude to the washing of creation and washing of all humanity in his very blood. As you and I engage in washing one another's feet, let us realize that we may be called to wash the world and humanity with our very lives and with our very blood. The future lies before you and me. I am grateful to you all for this fresh opportunity to share somewhat with you the theology and practice of reconciliation. Embrace the conciliation spirit. Advance this, the reconciliation mission. God bless you all. We'll invite the Archbishop to uh, take a couple questions and then we'll be gathering shortly for that uh, service of reconciliation, the midday prayer. Archbishop. just wanted to acknowledge uh, something you said about risks. Risks to break the inhuman systems. And one of the, of the feelings, the human feelings that accompany this is the, fe the constant feeling of awkwardness. 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 Feeling awkward. Yes. Feeling uncomfortable. And I've come to understand that that feeling is a sign that we are on the right track to reconciliation. Right. And you said it several times in terms of resistance and facing into distortions. And I believe, especially as, as public figures, that, that one of the feelings that we can assume is the feeling of awkwardness. So thank you for acknowledging the risks that must be taken. Thank you. Well, I had to go through a long process before I arrived at a more, I wouldn't call it a comfortable position, rather. I am always on the questioning side, probing myself, never to feel that I have arrived at the final destination in regard to ensuring that I am relating rightly to persons, especially in matters that touch race and ethnicity. Um, it requires a certain, a continued dying to oneself because I, rec I recognize my own pride and my own weaknesses. But since I've been able to own up my limitations, as an Igbo person, a Nigerian person, an African person, an interracial human being, I feel at home even in difficult circumstances. I don't give up. I can never give up because I've found an incredible freedom and courage to move on.
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, often in America, we think of the Portuguese white bringing blacks over to America for slavery. It's been made known, but not often publicized widely, that Africans sold Africans to Portuguese to bring them to America. To what extent do you think this knowledge, if spread abroad, would help create compassion, greater compassion, on all sides? It is true that slavery existed in various, at various levels in many cultures, many races. But the kind of systematic enslavement or commercialization of slaves of African descent is something completely novel within the African context. Where Africans were aiders and abettors came from the instigation from outside because from the stories we hear, at first those who were on the coastal plains were the ready targets of uh, the slave raiders. But along the line, uh, that spirit of commercialization entered those who saw some commercial benefit and they colluded with the Portuguese and others for the Or what we can say is that while the Portuguese and all the Europeans were the primary motivators of this awful slavery, the Africans who colluded were the subsidiary agents. I do acknowledge uh, that contribution, negative contribution of Africans to the selling of fellow Africans. And that is why my initial understanding of the African-American experience came only from the fact that I actually came in touch with African-Americans in America and they gave me the narrative of how they were, their ancestors were captured in Africa and brought over here. And immediately, I heard this narrative directly in my face, in my ears. My spirit left Washington, D.C. and traveled back 500 years to the coast of West Africa. And in the twinkle of an eye, my spirit came back. And lo and behold, Tears, tears had bedded my inner shirt and my after shirt. Tears of realization that these African Americans are my blood brothers. And I didn't know it because the time and space between my own birth and the time of this event were like non existent. So when I became aware, of what happened, I felt both a sense of guilt, a sense of frustration, which I narrate in my first talk on this matter. I was mad with everybody, mad with myself. And that is part of why I remain ever grateful now to the African Americans, because each time I come to America, and feel at home, it is because you suffered for me. Your sufferings have led to a certain welcome that I receive. And I will always say to my African-American brothers, on behalf of the rest of Africans, both those guilty and those not guilty, I am sorry for what my ancestors did to sell you my brothers and sisters. But we have to move on beyond that.
sheet says. We have a service. Uh, yes. Thank you. Each human, and particularly church group or civic group that is sensitive to the need for us to bond together more peacefully would have to take home the ideas, the challenges that have been raised within these two very intensive and auspicious days. I personally feel grateful and excited that I can continue my own work of breaking down walls of division or purifying my own person, myself, body, soul, and spirit so that I become a radiator of this filiation dynamic that Christ has brought into the world. So work, the work has to be done in, our, in my church, in our churches, in our schools. The conversation must be sustained so that the positive elements uh, that have been generated can be better shared and people can Learn how to confront, ask questions, awkward, ugly questions. In the process, you'll be able to know how to survive even with, within very difficult exchanges. They say human beings mature under the hammer blows of experience. So... I challenge each and every one of us to take this matter home to your family, to your church, to your workplace, and not just sniff at it because there's no room for feeling comfortable, no room for feeling superior or inferior to anybody. I don't feel superior to anybody. I don't feel inferior to anybody. I just want to be who God wants me to be. And in so doing, I activate the realization of all the persons. I empower them because I have been empowered by God to be who I am and to continue to achieve what God wishes me to achieve. So the dialogue must not end. Thank you.